<clears throat> Excellent. All right, so let's start with our meditation, the exciting part. We do about 30 minutes meditation this session. Do you have any question? I kind of read a question on your face. <laughs> Please sit comfortably and begin to calm your senses, transcending any worries and troubles from this day, this week. Sound the gong one more time. And gently close your eyes. Give yourself permission to be here and now. And give yourself permission to observe your breath quietly and invite your mind to observe your body in that we will do some body scanning which will be very important in your meditations exercise. Since you have done this thousand times maybe, your body will naturally find a comfortable posture but let us scan the body to make sure that we are seated properly and that you are experiencing some comfort in your body. Your face, your shoulders, the back of your head, your neck, your spine, these are at ease and your body is in an upright position, not leaning forward or backward, but more at ease. Don't worry if you are feeling any discomfort. Feel free to adjust, change your posture, or move closer to a wall, or get an extra cushion any time. Any time during this meditation. And pay attention to your chest and also notice the contraction, the expansion that is happening along with your breathing. Your belly and the pattern there with your inhaling and exhaling. It is noticed only when you pay attention to these natural patterns. And now your sitting bones are relaxed if that make any 
discomfort to you or make any sense to you. Time to adjust. Also notice the position of your hands. I place my right palm on my left palm, touching my thumbs sometimes. Sometimes one, one hand on my left thigh and the other on my right thigh. Just resting. And your lower parts of your body also requires attention. Adjust if you have to. And in the course of this meditation, make sure there is blood flow and comfort. Because minimum changes is important too, but you will change your posture if you have to. Bring an attitude of gratitude to this moment. Be grateful to your six sense faculties, but allow them to cool down. Since your eyes are closed now, there is no seeing activity, so your brain can rest. When there is no hearing activity, which means you may not be paying too much attention to any noises from outside world, so hearing can also cool down. And smelling part also cools down and the tasting part also cools down. Now when you are seated comfortably, physical sensations also do not distract you too much. And now the biggest challenge is thinking. Thinking about the past, thinking about the now, thinking about the future. And this is why we choose an object of meditation, which is going to be breathing in and breathing out for now. This has no color, no pattern, no shape, no disturbance to the mind. So let us bring the presence of the mind to your inhaling and exhaling and carefully observing deep inhaling and deep exhaling also the subtle inhalings and subtle exhalings like playing a little game to catch when your body is Taking a long breath, exhaling long and short breath, inhaling or exhaling short. So these four ways are important for us to bring the presence of mind to the breathing activity.
Mindfully you breathe in, mindfully you breathe out. It's okay whenever you feel distracted, don't think about, don't think about anything, don't think about keeping your attention on one thing, just be with your breath, it will happen naturally. Allow the mind to take the time and take delight in your breathing exercise. Let the, let the rhythm of your breathing in and out be revealed to your awareness. Now breathe in and breathe out, relaxing your body. Even then you will notice long and short breath. And at the same time you will notice problems arising Questions arising, family come into your mind, and that is okay. You come back to your awareness of breathing. The most important thing is to relax. Always bring your attention to relaxing. Relaxing your body will relax your mind. Feel the tranquility in some parts of your body right now and make room for that tranquility. That stillness is so important for you to rest and feel the presence of your mind. Feel the quiet, noise-free mind or be aware of it, whatever language you want to use. No big philosophy here, no dependent origination or anything. And it's okay if you have those in mind. But just this tranquility, stillness, 
is enough. Allow yourself, give yourself the permission to feel this expansiveness, open awareness, the Buddha nature, beginner's mind, whatever you want to call it. You're still coming back to your breathing. However subtle your breath becomes, you notice it. Even if you didn't do anything now, this room, this atmosphere itself will relax us. The fact that we came to a cushion, 50% of meditation is coming to the cushion and the rest happens naturally. Experiencing luminous mind, let us remain in this state or whatever the state that arises for 
another couple of minutes and then we will come out of the meditation. That silence, if you heard it, perhaps is an opportunity for us to think whoever is involved, may this person be well. It's an opportunity for us to send loving kindness, unbinding or non-grieving compassion to them. wrapping them up with a blanket, using that noise as a, an opportunity to cultivate these beautiful qualities that humans can cultivate in their hearts. So it's never a distraction, it is just a blessing that we heard it. It's a blessing to us that we can cultivate and you know cultivate loving kindness with these opportunities and expand with compassion infinite compassion in these moments and that my friend can be labeled as non-judgmental awareness And now come out of the meditation. You can stretch, really. Sending you to school. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a little handout prepared for this day. Okay. Actually, it's some basics that we already know, but sometimes it feels like it's important to revisit them uh, and, and talk about them, although we already know most of it. I'm like, why not? And we must have uh, heard these terms again and again in our Dharma talks. But I thought uh, we can use some simple language to talk about the eightfold path. Um, I don't know. I don't take any one of you as beginners here. Um, so, but I have used that word. Here, but I also wanted to incorporate some uh, humor <laughs> into it. So we will find out. Um, 
So the Eightfold Path, I think the Buddha discovered it and named it that way when he tried other paths. He went, um, how many years? 29 years as a prince in a royal palace in the comforts that his father gave him. Very lucky life. Um, lavish lifestyle. There is a palace for every season in your country. <laughs> right? Yes. Not everyone is that fortunate to have that kind of luxury and a father. Um, and he never complained. And then he started seeing signs that this is, there's, there was a calling in his in his heart that he felt when he's especially when he saw the four signs the sight of a elderly person sight of a dead body being carried away that like they do in india in in nepal as well in sri lanka as well and a, a sight of a sick person who's crying for medicine and health agile and then the sight of a monk who is apparently young and abled but is choosing to live a different life and he started questioning why he is choosing to live that kind of life so in, in that questioning in his own mind and asking questions from his companion Channa who was his friend from childhood he started seeing the danger of the life he had. It's beautiful, but he saw, you know, this is this is not the way. And then he left everything. Some suttas, some discourses say that Ma, you know, his mother and father were crying when when he left. This is called great renunciation. And uh, he did six years of search, and this is called noble search, that he was looking for the noble truth. And he was misguided. His friends, uh, teachers he, he met, some of them taught him meditation, some of them taught him um, self-mortification. And that is the contrast from the luxurious life he had and then the self-mortification he was taught, you know, toward the last couple of months in his six years of search. Not all those years he was uh, doing the self-mortification. It only takes so many years for starving the body and experiencing that starvation. And he explains in uh, Mahasachaka Sutta, Middle End Discourses number 26, that when he touched his belly, he touched the backbone. That is how skinny he was. And his body hair fell from his skin. And he had no energy whatsoever left. So when he tried to walk, he fell off right there. So that's the extreme uh, practice he did. And that's the mis misguidance that he had. And he knew that anyone, any recluse who tried this must have experienced this. And that is the, this is the maximum that anyone can try. And if they go any further, they would die without achieving anything. So he decided to give up on that practice as well. So he labeled it as an extreme and also label the first experience he had for 29 years as an extreme. He said, choose the middle path. And he placed right understanding as a first factor of this path because he was misguided by others. And he thought, come to right understanding and then let's talk about it from there. That's how he um started teaching, especially to his five companions who were with him, supporting him in the self-mortification. When he started eating again, 
they gave up on him. Like your friends are the first people to sometimes discourage you. <laughs> <laughs> they say, you can do it. <laughs> but he went back to them and he realized how it's supposed to be done, how things should be realized. And then he taught them right understanding as the first thing. And it only makes sense when you put, put the Eightfold Path into that context, that this is why right understanding is the first thing. Otherwise, why bother? If someone would ask, you know, why, why, why this right view is important? You know? So that's where we are. And uh, I, I have um, put it as a bit like gearing up for a life quest. <clears throat> so imagine yourself as a hero of this quest and the Eightfold Path is your toolkit to make it through the trials, uh, tra trails, right? And tribulations of life. Also, is it trials or trails? Trials. Trials, thank you. <laughs> So the first one is called right understanding, also known as right view. And in Pali, this is called Sama Bitti. This is the compass. So knowing which way is north. Think of right view as your compass. On any adventure, you need to know where you are headed, right? This is like understanding the basic map of life. There is suffering, there is a course, but good news, there is also a way out. Without a good compass, you might end up chasing your tail or worse, walking off a cliff. So it's best to know that there is suffering, there is the, the way that it arises and the cessation of it, and the path leading to the cessation of it. That includes meditation and all that. So this is a kind of understanding that is needed for us to have the next step, to have right thoughts in, in, in your mind. So the motivation to meditate. What is in your backpack? This is the packing, like packing your backpack for the trip. Are you bringing anger, greed or jealousy? in your backpack or probably not helpful on a peaceful journey, right? Instead, pack your bag with kind, kindness, compassion, and letting go of cravings, like the, the renunciation he did, letting go of that life of indulgence. He had many girls to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to come please him, actually. In, in, in that, I'm not saying in a bad way, like there were dancers, always arranged to please his eyes. He did not see any point of indulging in that any longer. It's so like this is not the true meaning of life. You know, every, any person who would experience it to that extreme would say that this is not really how I want to live my life. Leave me alone. He probably came to that understanding. And he started to, so anyone who has that understanding has to cultivate right thoughts, letting go. I'm not going back to that life. This is not what I want to do. So with that intention, also he gives up on anger and chooses loving kindness and gives up cruelty and chooses compassion, gives up jealousy and chooses joy in the heart. You are happy for others. These are right, this begins with, these begin with right mindset, right? And then with that right mindset, you begin to also make lifestyle changes, such as the next step, which is right speech, called Samma Vacha. This is like walkie-talkie how you communicate with fellow travelers in life. You can always choose. You can spread rumors or speak wisely. You can speak divisively or speak to unite people. 
So these are the choices that you make. These are lifestyle changes. This is really important for us. <clears throat> so this is this walkie-talkie's battery is not wasted on gossip and mean <laughs> language. <laughs> There's a lot of energy that goes into gossiping, right? Mm -hmm. we, we waste so much time. And we don't stop there. Right speech is not enough. We do right action. We choose what actions are suitable for a life uh, that is beneficial to others. And you do choose harmless actions. And harmful actions include killing others, harming other living beings. Right? And the the metaphor here is the, your sword of honor. Do the right thing. Imagine you've got a shiny sword, but it's not for fighting or killing, but using it honorably. No stealing or harming others on this quest. Every hero knows that their deeds matter. So follow the knightly code. Help others and don't be a jerk. <laughs> not monk language. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now um, this actually is about five precepts, you know, not killing, not stealing, um, not engaging in sexual, sexual misconduct, not telling lies. And, you know, that, that te not telling lies is about right speech too. And uh, not engage, you know, not, not indulging in alcohol and stuff. So one of the senior monks I met, uh, I saw, I went to visit recently uh, in West Virginia. He says, you know, in terms of alcohol precept, mm -hmm. is sura mere. Sometimes, you know, something like rice can be intoxicating when you take too much of it. There's like some uh, sugar rush, you know, that you feel so overindulging. Um, it's not about, you know, you can go to parties and that's okay. You can have a, um, I shouldn't quote him on this, you can have a glass of a wine, but you don't have to indulge in, you can just sip a little bit, but not put yourself into a level of intoxication where um, you don't, you cannot drive, you cannot have a coherent conversation with another person. Those you, if, if those things are banned, then we are going to another extreme there. Mm -hmm. There should be some balance here. That's, I think I like that explanation. I don't know if I'm making any sense here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Buddhist police, please don't come after me. <laughs> 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 so, with that kind of lifestyle change, you also choose right effort. You know, the energy bar boost up and keep going you know always keep going in any adventure you are going to get tired or distracted right whether by netflix or a dragon mm -hmm. <laughs> right effort is like an energy bar you focus on the positive stuff avoid negativity and keep refreshing your good habits Think of it as recharging your mental batteries for the long haul, right? Mental battery. You know, sometimes we, we get lazy. We forget that we need to have, be consistent on a meditation practice, chanting practice, you know, or speak right or do right things or contemplate on right understanding. We forget. And having come to number six, we come to number seven, right? Mindfulness. That's the magical map, seeing things clearly, bringing the presence of the mind to things that you do and choosing wisely, mentally. Now you can choose anger or you can choose loving kindness. Both require a presence of your mind. And that presence of mind with right intention is called right mindfulness. And that suggests that there is wrong mindfulness. You can focus on things that are addictive or things that are beneficial to your psychological and physical well-being. Things like 
daily routine of exercise, stretching. These are these also require some mindfulness, right? Stretching requires some mindfulness. Taking a walk requires, you know, mindfulness. Sitting correctly for us always require mindfulness. Um, and um, meditation habits require mindfulness. Telling yourself that, or, uh, you know, do this, do that, but with an attitude of loving kindness. That also requires those mental activities, remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. That is mindfulness. And relaxing every time. That is mindfulness. <clears throat> and with that kind of preparedness, you are ready for deep stillness. That is the reward at the end of traveling this path. The mountain view that you are going to see, the, the breathtaking view you are going to see is coming up now. Mm -hmm. And also this is here, it's the shield of focus, keeping your eye on the rice, really. Right concentration is like a shield that helps you stay focused and block distractions. Distractions are hindrances, you know, sensual indulgences, anger patterns, cursing and all that, doubting, restlessness, getting anxious for a result. <laughs> you know, even when you are traveling the Eightfold Path plane, you may want to land quickly. <laughs> you want to be the pilot that lands, you know, sooner and you may end up crashing. You don't want to do that. So it's not about daydreaming about your victory party. It's staying focused until you actually slay the dragon or finish that task. Even when you come to a 30 minutes meditation, you need some patience to really finish, wrap up, mm -hmm. and take the that pride, I think, humble pride that you did it and you do it again and again. And then uh, the next section is about how each part includes into three categories. I'm not going to read them, but right speech, right action, right livelihood. Right livelihood is about ethical conduct and right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration is about mental uh, development, concentration, and right view or right understanding and intention, this is about wisdom, it requires wisdom. So these are packed, these eight are packed into three called uh, ethics, concentration, and wisdom. Ethics is called seal because it's about behavior, and uh, concentration is called samadhi, stillness of your mind, and next. The uh, view requires wisdom and intention. You know, always choosing right intention. And when you can read the last second before the last paragraph, when sila, samadhi and panya are developed together, they lead to liberation. You are liberated from so many problems you had in life, ways of thinking and views you held so far, you can let go. That you understand when you forget to chant, the Buddha is not going to punish you or a god, a deity is not going to punish you. When you forget to say a mantra before sleep, no one is going to punish you. You just have much, much more wisdom to deal with such thoughts. I'm not sure if you made you know if you made a connection with what I was saying. You know, I, I was listening to a podcast. I don't remember which teachers, but they were saying they had a habit of as children they used to chant or say a prayer before going to bed, and then they gave up on it. But they used to have fear as children that if I don't say this prayer there will be something coming out of my, you know, under the bed or someone will punish me. But to them, letting go of that and seeing that nobody punished them was a liberation, mini liberation. Yeah. To, to my father, 
he had to light six or seven seventh one is to the buddha six candles to six deities kali vishnu local deities and he must come home and light them otherwise he he thinks that somebody will punish him and he had those experiences that someone pushed him out of the bed or something like that but now he's a monk he doesn't do any any of those things and he still gets a good sleep mm -hmm. letting go of these views are so liberating mm -hmm. in villages you know in uh, south asia or locally here as well in the us you find people who have these beliefs small beliefs who are you know who find it there's some fear element attached to it i think right understanding and liberation are connected with you know with knowing that there's no need to look at fear the same way you can see the fear rising with with proper wisdom with deep stillness in your mind you see how it's not you doing it things arise when conditions are present or thoughts involving fear or when fear is so fast programmed to your your mind from childhood you that happens it's not you doing it it's not somebody else punishing you it's your deep mind that can do that it can play tricks or it's, it can create an illusion that doesn't exist and there can be many liberations knowing that you don't have to blame yourself or blame anybody for any of that you just accept allow things to be and there's ultimate liberation some day and you are you know you are okay with you know losing so much but there is liberation that you gained so they all these form a harmonious path where ethical living mental focus and deep wisdom work hand in hand to help you overcome suffering fear is a form of suffering you overcome it with your own wisdom without waiting for somebody else to a buddha in the in 300 million years later to come and rescue you <laughs> the buddha says no one can save you you yourself should save you right think of it like leveling up in your life quest each part helps you unlock the next stage of freedom from suffering right by understanding how sila samadhi and pajna come together you are not just wandering aimlessly you've got a structured reliable path for navigating the adventure of life that's all 6:50 now we have about 5 10 minutes to chat if you want oh i can wrap up now any questions from zoom <clears throat> Or was it helpful? Yes, yes. Thank you. Nicole, if you are talking, I can hear you. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, oh, I was holding up all my notes to show. That is very helpful. Wonderful. I am happy. You know, we were reading deep stuff, right? And I think it's time for us to take a break and go to simple stuff this is not simple but i think uh, uh, we can revisit them and make it simple yes. and perhaps think more and utilize it in our daily lives yeah Okay, shall we share merits? Then please bring your palms together and let's share merits. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. may beings inhabiting space and earth devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours 
May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. May they long protect each and every one of you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, thank you everyone. Good night. Thank you.